we're now going to talk about polar covalent bonds. Polar covalent bonds is sort of a modification of Lewis's original picture of how bonding works. So if we look at Lewis's original proposal, Lewis originally proposed that when a covalent bond was formed, the two atoms would get together and they would share their electrons equally. In other words, each atom would get an exact 50% share of the electrons. However, when scientists started looking at the, the math and the other aspects of the bonding theory, what they discovered was that electrons are not always shared exactly equally in a covalent bond. In fact, what they discovered was this. If the two atoms in the bond are not identical atoms, in other words, not the same element, then the more electronegative atom would pull uh, a greater share of the electrons toward itself. I think this is best explained by looking at an example. A good example of this is the hydrogen to oxygen bond, which we find in many common substances, including water. When we look at the hydrogen to oxygen bond, and then we look at the periodic table, we see that oxygen has a higher electronegativity than hyd hydrogen. As a result, it's going to pull more than its 50% share of electrons in the bond toward itself. Now, when we get to the bonding theory, we're going to talk about how really one of the best ways to represent electrons in bonds is to look at them as a cloud of electron charge. So in the Lewis theory, Lewis would envision this cloud as being perfectly symmetric, looking something like this, where 50% of the cloud was surrounding the hydrogen and 50% of the cloud was surrounding the oxygen. But in the polar covalent bond, theory, what we see is that the oxygen should pull part of this cloud toward itself so that the cloud becomes distorted and it becomes more egg-shaped. Now, I'm using made-up numbers here, and I don't know what the actual numbers are, but I'm sure that there is a way to calculate that. We don't really care what the exact numbers are. What we care about is just knowing that one side is bigger than the other. What is the trend? So if, for example, the oxygen pulled an extra 20% of the electrons toward itself, it would then have 70% of the electron cloud around it. And the hydrogen would have only 30% of the electron cloud, since the 20% has to come by taking away from hydrogen. And so then, we could just do 30% of two electrons, that would be 0.6 electrons surrounding that hydrogen rather than one entire electron. And similarly, on the oxygen side, 70% of two electrons would be 1.4 electrons surrounding the oxygen. The importance of this comes when we look at what it does to formal charges. When we calculated formal charges, we assumed, just as Lewis did, that the electrons in a bond were perfectly equally shared, so that when an atom had a bond, it would own exactly one electron for that bond. It would own exactly 50% of two electrons. However, if the electrons in the bond are not equally shared, then the amount of electrons that an atom will own from that bond will change. If it's the more electronegative atom, it will own slightly more than one electron. That would, that, and we will see in the calculation, that's going to give it a slight negative charge. In contrast, the other atom would then own slightly less than one electron, which would give it a slight positive charge. So let's do the calculation. Again, we're going to be using made up numbers, okay? So I'm just going to use these numbers that I made up here. Again, there's probably a way to, de to determine more exactly what these numbers really, quote unquote, should be. So let's look at hydrogen. 
Hydrogen always wants one electron when it's in a bond. If that hydrogen is only going to get 0.6 electrons from that bond, that means it will only own, own 0.6 instead of 1. So 1 minus 0.6 is positive 0.4. So that means that hydrogen has a slight positive charge of 0.4. It's not 100%. It's not a 1 positive. It's a 0.4 positive. We have a symbol to represent that I'm going to show you in just a moment. If we look on the oxygen side, the oxygen wants six electrons, but in this case, it's going to own five electrons, two for here, two for here, one for that bond, which we're going to ignore whatever's on the end of that bond. Okay. But then we said for this oxygen to hydrogen bond, it would actually own 1.4 electrons. So that adds up to five plus 1.4, 6.4 electrons. When we then subtract, what we get is that that oxygen get, should get uh, a negative point. That should actually be a negative point 0.4. That's a typo. It should be a negative point 0.4 charge. Okay, They should balance out because the overall thing still has to be neutral. Ah, typo there. At any rate, therefore we see that now this bond is no longer neutral. It has a positive 0.4 on one end and a negative 0.4, ignore the 6, on that end. Okay, so we can represent these charges as shown here. Okay, In this case then what we see is that the hydrogen has a positive charge. The symbol that we use for having a partial positive charge instead of 100% of a positive charge is this. This is the Greek letter de lowercase delta, and then we put a positive, so delta positive, partial positive charge. Similarly, we see that the oxygen has a delta negative, partial negative charge. Again, we don't need to worry about the actual numbers. We just need to know that because this oxygen is pulling in that direction, the hydrogen is going to be lacking some slight amount of electrons and have a positive charge, and the oxygen is going to have a slight excess of electrons and have a partial negative charge. Now, the other thing that we do is we have a way of representing this shift in charge. So covalent bonds with oppositely charged ends are called polar covalent bonds, or sometimes just polar bonds, okay? And that word, polar, is actually just a generalized word that means sort of having opposites in space or opposites. So for example, you may have heard that our politics is polarized, right? Between two kind of opposite positions, okay? So polarity is the general property of having oppositely charged ends when it's used in chemistry. Now, to represent the polarity of a bond then, what we can do is we can use an arrow that points toward the negative end of the bond. So remember the oxygen was the partial negative. And what we do is we put a cross on the positive end of the bond. So this is called the bond polarity arrow, or sometimes the dipole moment of the bond. Although, uh, we're going to also use that term for molecules themselves. So the size of the polarity in a bond is called the dipole moment. And it depends on both the difference in electronegativity between the two atoms and the length of the bond. So it's sort of a symbol for this equation. Dipole moment is equal to the difference in charge times the length of a bond. So dipole moment gets bigger when your charges are bigger, but it also gets bigger when the bond is longer with the same amount of charge. In general, we are not going to calculate any numbers like this, um, but it is something that in physical chemistry can be calculated. One thing that can be confusing about polarity as it's used in organic chemistry is that in organic chemistry we talk about polar bonds 
but then we also talk about polar molecules. And often organic chemists can be a little sloppy about indicating whether they're talking about polar bonds or polar molecules because they just assume that somebody would understand it in context. So we're going to try to be very careful to make it clear whether we're talking about polar bonds or more or uh, polar molecules. Okay, so polar molecules. When a molecule has oppositely charged ends, it's called a polar molecule in the same way that a bond that has oppositely charged ends is called a polar bond. Now there is another term that's used for polar molecules. They are often called dipoles, which just means sort of two opposite ends, right? Now, molecule polarity is unfortunately much more complex than bond polarity. The reason is that it involves both the polarity of the bonds inside the molecule and the three-dimensional shape of the molecule. So what we're going to be doing then is we're going to be sort of putting together our Lewis structure knowledge of a molecule. We're going to be putting together our VSEPR picture of the molecule and then our understanding of the bond polarities in the molecule to predict whether the overall molecule is polar. So to determine if a molecule is polar, first thing we need to do is we need to know the shape of the molecule. Then what we're going to do is we're going to, it, we're going to determine all of the bond dipoles and put those dipole arrows on aligned in the same direction as those bonds, parallel to those bonds. Then what we're going to do is what's called vector addition. Vectors are arrows that indicate the size and direction of a number when that number is talking about something in three-dimensional space. So bond dipole moment arrows are vectors because in theory we draw them a certain size to indicate the magnitude and we draw them in an exact direction indicating the location of the bond. What we're going to be doing then is adding up all the bond dipole errors. This is something that you do in physics if you've taken say calculus-based physics. You do this a lot but if you've never seen this before it's actually pretty easy once you get used to it. So what you do to add vectors is you take the vectors from the bond dipoles and you move them over in space and you put first one vector so here's this dipole it starts here it goes that way and then you take the next vector and you put it so it starts where the first vector ends so this vector would start here and then it would go up to there and then you keep at lining up these vectors if there was another vector, you would start at the end of this second one and line it up and so forth. Keep lining them up until you've used up all the vectors. Then you draw one more arrow that starts at the very beginning of the first vector arrow and points to the very end of the last vector arrow. So if we look at water, for example, water has these two OH bonds and it has this bent shape that we talked about because if we look, water has two bonds, it has two lone pairs. So these atoms are going to be pushed down away from the lone pairs. And in fact, the actual angle is 104.5 degrees, but the ideal angle would be 109. We then have these arrows, and they should line up parallel to these bonds, so they're at 104.5 degree angles, and the hydrogen is the positive end, so we put the cross there, and the arrow points toward the negative end like that. So now I take that arrow, I put it here, I then take the second arrow, I start it where the first one ended and put it there, and then finally to add them up, I draw this red arrow, which starts at the first beginning of the first arrow and points to the end of the second arrow. And you can see that arrow points in a completely different direction from the two original bond dipoles. We then just take that arrow and we put it back onto the molecule as close to the center of that atom of that molecule as we can. And so we can see that 
this molecule has a dipole moment. It's a polar molecule. This end down here is the positive end, and this end up here is the more negative end. Another way to represent this, then, would be to use partial positives and partial negatives. So if we imagine that this molecule has sort of this v, uh, inverted V-shaped cloud of electrons, what we're saying is that the electron cloud on this side is a little bit weaker, and it has a little bit, it leaves a little bit of positive charge, whereas the electron cloud on this side is a little bit stronger and has a little bit of negative charge. And so you can see that water has a positive end down here near the hydrogens and a negative end up here near the oxygen. Water is a very typical polar molecule. So to summarize then, the vector sum of the bond dipoles is actually another vector. And in this case, it has a length greater than zero. And so what we say is that water has a net dipole moment. That makes water a polar molecule. Now, the significance of the VSEPR of the geometry in this is that molecules can have polar bonds but not be polar molecules. This occurs when the bond dipoles balance each other out in three-dimensional space. Or, in other words, a molecule will not be polar when the vector sum of its bond dipoles is zero. Now, how does this happen? Well, this happens when we line up all the vectors and it turns out the last vector that we place ends up pointing toward the very beginning of the first vector that we place. In that case, we would say the molecule has no net dipole moment and therefore would be a nonpolar molecule. So a really good example of this is carbon dioxide. So this is a representation of carbon dioxide leaving off the lone pairs. We can see we have a carbon in the center, a double bonded oxygen on one side, a double bonded oxygen on the other. And so with regard to the central carbon, there are only two electron groups. It has a steric number of two. This is going to give it a linear geometry and, since there's atoms on the end of those electron groups, a linear shape. And those bonds are going to be oriented 180 degrees apart. Now, when we look at those individual bonds, we see that oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. And so we have bond dipole arrows that start on the carbon, point toward the oxygen, the cross is near the carbon, but they point in opposite directions. So if we take these and we slide them over, we take this one and put it here. So we start there, we go to here, then we would take this one and put it basically right on top. I slid it over a little bit, but we would start where the first one ended and it would go back. It would end where the first one started. So the second vector ends where the first one starts. That means that when we attempt to draw an arrow, there is no arrow. There's just a point, right? And that means that there's no net dipole moment. CO2 is a nonpolar molecule. If we were to redraw this and look at it in terms of where the partial positives and partial negatives are, we would see that CO2 has two negative ends and a positive middle. And therefore, this is not a polar molecule. A polar molecule is a molecule where there are ends that are oppositely charged.